tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's very scary and concerning. A former youth hockey coach at the Burnaby Winter Club charged with possessing child pornography also. Now admittedly this matter is and has been an absolute nightmare. On leave after a sexual assault charge, Port Moody's mayor returns to office. And booze on board, beer and wine on BC Ferries. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, Anita is on assignment tonight. A former youth hockey coach at an elite club in Burnaby is facing several charges of possession of child pornography. As the CBC's Leanne Young reports, the accusations came as a surprise to his former employer. Staff and volunteers here at the Burnaby Winter Club got the call on Wednesday night from police with the disturbing news. A former coach at the club had been charged with multiple counts of possession of child pornography. The next morning, more details emerged about the charges and news that the suspect had been released on conditions. All information that came as a shock to the volunteers and parents at the club. When you hear um, that your children may have been in contact uh, with an adult in a situation like this, it's, it's very scary and concerning. A publication ban has been issued, so we can't name the suspect. But the charges relate to the possession of child pornography, the intention to lure a person under the age of 16, and the importation and distribution of child pornography. The president of the club says the suspect was an assistant coach in 2013 and hired again just last year on a one-year contract as a head coach. We never had a complaint about that coach. Um, and, uh, and even in the year-end surveys that we do with the families of that coach, uh, there was nothing but positive reviews. So, um, you know, it was a shock to us. A meeting was held yesterday for members of the club. Around 75 people attended, mostly parents. Port Moody officers were on hand, along with victim services counselors offering advice. Ward says parents had plenty of questions for police, mostly around whether any of the kids were directly affected. We were told at that time that if, if they had information that directly involved parents at the club, then chances are they would have heard from the police already. Um, that doesn't mean anything, but at this, at this time, there was no indication. The Burnaby Winter Club is one of the most elite level hockey clubs in Western Canada, coaching kids from ages 6 to 17. Ward says they've implemented policies to help prevent any inappropriate behavior, like requiring criminal record checks and two adults in a room at all times and not allowing cell phones in any of the change rooms. But even then, he says they will be reviewing their policies and tightening things up to protect its players even further. Leanne Young, CBC News, Burnaby. The mayor of Port Moody is back on the job tonight, almost six months since he went on leave facing a sexual assault charge. Rob Vagramoff claims things have changed in his case and he's now able to return to work. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett is here live with more on the story tonight. So Dan, what has changed? Mike, it's still not clear. The mayor won't say and neither will his lawyer nor the Crown. In late March, Vagramoff temporarily stepped down after a special prosecutor approved a sexual assault charge against him. The alleged offense took place in 2015 when Vagramoff was a city councillor. Other councillors stepped in to act as mayor and serve on various boards on his behalf. The Crown says Vagramoff's case is still to be in provincial court this Thursday, but the mayor says things are different now. And what was initially pursued as quite a scary indictment has since been starkly uh, reduced to a summary matter with the Crown and my legal counsel uh, now exploring a resolution that would not involve a trial at all. From this point forward, this process should no longer require uh, the level of involvement and attention that it once did, and as such, I no longer require the leave granted to me uh, from my responsibilities here at City Hall. But after his prepared statement, Vagramov repeatedly said he cannot say anything about the court case itself as it's before the courts. He faced plenty of questions. We asked why he's coming back now rather than waiting until Thursday or after to return to the job. Vagramov claims there's too much to do. The amount of cleanup that needs to get done since the last term, the change of direction that the people voted for, uh, these are big ticket items and they take a really long time to get moving. Um, so to answer your question, why, why not wait? It's simply there, there needs to be time to get these things done and there's already been quite a bit of, of time lost to this matter. 
Vagramov does say another councillor will still fill in for him as chair of the Port Moody Police Board. He says that's the right thing to do given the court case. Vagramov's lawyer, Ian Donaldson, tells us he will not comment on the case as it's before the courts. And the Crown tells CBC News as of June, the special prosecutor indicated they plan to proceed summarily, usually indicating the court process will be simpler and penalties lower. We hope to find out on Thursday. Mike? Okay, Dan. Dan Barrett reporting tonight. Thanks. Now, some campers and activists from Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park made a move from the downtown east side today, setting up another illegal encampment, but this time at City Hall. The tents were pitched to protest Mayor Kennedy Stewart. Last week, Stewart called out the park board, which has jurisdiction over Oppenheimer Park. He said homeless people remaining in the park needed a little nudge to clear them out. Now the activists are nudging back, saying they won't be bullied. For his part, the mayor was on the early edition with Stephen Quinn here at CBC this morning. He was addressing concerns raised during Saturday's CBC Town Hall on the state of the downtown east side. Yeah, I heard the word ghetto, Yeah, which uh, really made the hair stand up in the back of my neck. So it told me that I still have a lot of work to do to make sure that we're drawing everybody in this city into the fact that this isn't an us versus them situation. This is an us situation and we're all neighbors and we can't, if we're lost, if we consider a part of the city a ghetto, which I don't. Quite a big crowd gathered at the Woodward's building Saturday for CBC's town hall on the state of the downtown east side. Issues like addiction, poverty, and homelessness came up, with many saying they'd had enough. If you want to check out more of that forum, you can find the whole thing on CBC Gem. A man has been charged with manslaughter for the death of 37-year-old Sean Cotter. Surrey RCMP found Cotter's body in the morning of January 17th, back in 2018. At the time, his death was considered suspicious. Now, more than a year and a half later, Stephen Mueller has been charged with manslaughter in relation to Cotter's death. Mueller was arrested last week, but has since been released with a number of conditions. The date for his next court appearance is still pending. Four years after a deadly police-involved shooting, a coroner's inquest is being held into just how the confrontation unfolded. 48-year-old Kenneth Robert Hanna and 47-year-old Matthew Charles Miles died in a home on Francis Street in Burnaby back in September 2015. Members of the Lower Mainland Emergency Response Team were sent to the home after a woman inside called 911. When officers arrived, shots were fired and Hanna died at the scene. Miles was found dead inside the home. Inquests are, of course, mandatory when someone dies while detained or in police custody. The Independent Investigations Office is looking into how police actions or inactions might have played a role in the case of a North Vancouver woman who was found dead in her apartment. Elizabeth Johanna Naparala was reported missing last Tuesday. RCMP completed a welfare check at her home days before her death. She was last seen in the Woodcroft building on Fullerton Avenue. The possibilities are that she was in the residence the whole time or that she had left the residence and returned. Um, those are exactly the types of questions that we are looking at at this, this point in an effort to gauge uh, the reasonableness of the actions of the police. She was found inside her apartment Thursday afternoon just after 1 o'clock. Cause of death is still unknown. Curtis Sagmoen pleaded not guilty in B.C. Supreme Court today over allegations he threatened a sex trade worker with a gun while wearing a mask. The alleged crimes happened in August 2017, and the 38-year-old was arrested two months later. Since then, he's been convicted in two other trials for crimes against women. Investigators found human remains on Sagmoen's parents' farm, but no charges have been laid. His court appearances have become a rallying cry for people protesting violence against women. The trial is expected to last several days. Vancouver police are asking for the public's help in locating a high-risk offender who didn't return to his halfway house on Sunday. 26-year-old Talon Francis Brent Chikosis is wanted on a Canada-wide warrant for breaching his release conditions. He was serving time after being charged as an accessory after the fact for murder, assault, and aggravated assault with a weapon. Chikosis is Indigenous, 5 feet 10, dark hair, brown eyes. He's last seen wearing a black jacket, gray athletic pants, and a black ball cap. 
Anyone who sees the man or has information about him should call 911 right away. Well, a Vancouver Island family is devastated tonight after their cat had to be put down because somebody shot it with a pellet gun. A two-year-old black cat known as Briggs appeared to be ill when he returned to his Oak Bay home September 1st. Concerned owner took Briggs to a vet a few days later, and that's when they discovered he'd been shot. X-rays showed the cat was hit in the belly with a pellet gun and had to be put down because of his injuries. Somebody in that neighborhood will know of somebody that has a pellet gun, so that would be a great starting place for us. Whether that's uh, an adult or a child, somebody's got a pellet gun. Anyone with information is asked to call Oak Bay Police or Crime Stoppers. After a devastating fire destroyed a school last week, officials in Kamloops have found a new home for almost 400 students. Here are investigators on site days after flames ripped through Park Crest Elementary. Now students and staff are going to spend the rest of the school year at the former George Hilliard Elementary. It's about one and a half kilometers away from Park Crest. Officials hope to have students resettled by next Monday. Well, BC is seeing its worst commercial fishing season in 50 years, at least according to First Nations and union leaders. Advocates say the federal and provincial governments need to step in to help fishermen because salmon runs have plummeted and because at least 2,500 people have been affected by the downturn. We're here today to call upon the government for disaster relief for the communities that still rely on commercial fishing up and down this coast. Chamberlain says global warming is an added stressor for the salmon. Well, it was quite the spectacle in downtown Vancouver earlier this afternoon. It's still summer, although you wouldn't know it looking outside. Uh, a deluge downtown is proof that all you need is that fall is almost here. Have a look. Yeah, the downpour only lasted about half an hour or so, but it was more than enough to flood some streets and create quite a buzz all over social media. Yeah, there was a lot of rain. There was a lot of rain, and I know, like, I was kind of the person to say, well, this is Vancouver, it rains. Yeah. But when yeah. I looked into it, this was actually borderline to being a thunderstorm. So there wasn't actual any lightning um, or any thunder associated with this, but there was just enough energy in the atmosphere to produce this really heavy downpour. And if you were, say, in Delta, if you were in South Surrey, you have no idea what we're talking about. But downtown, I wanted to zoom in and show you, there was this really powerful cell that just went over right into the early afternoon hours, and that's what caused all of the rain. And if you want to see another look at what that was. Maybe you weren't downtown, maybe you didn't see it or experience it yourself, but certainly causing a lot of localized flooding there on the sides of the roads, and people definitely got out their umbrellas as a way to kind of, you know, mitigate some of that falling rain. But the question on everyone's mind then, is there going to be more of that coming into the future? And yes, we are at this point in time where fall is starting to transition over us right now, and that means showers are going to be here, but we do have a little bit more to wait until then. Right now, temperatures are going to be a little bit closer to seasonal 19 degrees we haven't seen this in a little while but that is right where we should be for this time of the year and in terms of overnight temperatures we're going to be seeing temperatures go down to about 15 degrees or so but by tomorrow we can expect a fairly similar day for Vancouver proper looking at anywhere between 19 and 20 and if you're headed out say toward the Tri-Cities even toward Abbotsford you're still going to be getting a few peaks of sun and temperatures there kind of into the low 20s but when I come back for the next update I will let you know about how much rain is going to be coming toward the end of the week because it is more than we've seen in a really long time. Mike? Oh boy. All right, Brett, thanks for talking to Beth. Sounds good. And still on the water, so to speak, a massive 30,000 ton cruise ship retrofit is underway over in North Vancouver. That is the MV Regatta, the 680 passenger flagship. It's stationed at the C SPAN Vancouver dry dock in Lower Lonsdale. Meanwhile, another new ship, the Grand Classica, is going to be used to house all the workers that are going to be retrofitting that ship. In fact, 2,000 contractors will work on new finishings, new furnishings, TV systems, and other upgrades. It'll take a little more than two weeks to complete. And starting next month, BC Ferries will be offering booze on select sailings. BC Ferries is adding beer and wine to the Pacific Buffet menu beginning late October. It was supposed to happen back in June. The service will be available on three Tawasson Swartz Bay ferries for a one-year trial. Alcohol must be purchased with a meal with a one-drink limit per person. 
Passengers will be allowed one five ounce glass of wine or one 12 ounce glass of beer. Just a reminder, you can watch this newscast and all of CBC's other award-winning content wherever you go by downloading the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow us on all platforms for extra content you won't see here on TV. A well, minor hockey season has started, and already there's been an ugly incident. Coming up, the on-ice violence involving parents and a referee. Well, thanks for tuning in uh, online where we are commercial free during the next uh, three minutes. And during tonight's regularly scheduled uh, commercial break, we've got a rare find to tell you about. Uh, scratch that, make it four dozen rare finds. Dean Stoltz from Czech News introduces us to a Victoria man who found quite the surprise in his evening meal. From a beach in Bain Sound, south of Courtney, to a frying pan in Victoria, Oysters were on the menu last night for Eric Borquin and his wife at a friend's house. We just pan frying them up and uh, we started having them as appetizers. That's when Eric cuts one in half and slides the battered delicacy into his mouth. I bit into one and I thought, wow, that mouthful of rocks or something I nearly busted my teeth. I thought he was choking on something. I was like, what's he doing? And all of a sudden, all these pearls started coming out. They couldn't believe what they were seeing because even more pearls were coming out of the other half. We were just thinking, wow, this is unreal. Like, it just kept coming. You know, and I was squishing the other half of the oyster, and it just, they were coming out from everywhere. In total, there are 48 pearls, most of them small and round, but two of them are as big as molars. Quite a surprise. Yeah. Since we've been on the West Coast our whole lives, and never heard of anything like this or so how rare is it well we went to the shores of bean like sound now. and max yeah, oysters yeah, yeah. to find out the biggest question is how rare is that oh that's way rare to find 48 is uh yeah it's pretty awesome he says someone he knows did find over 150 pearls once but when a single worker here shucks 1200 oysters a day and the odd time they might find one pearl you get the sense of how rare it is, and all it takes is a bit of sand to get inside the shell. It'll go inside the oyster. The oyster will coat it with the uh, mother of pearl to stop the irritant. And, uh, you know, it just keeps coating away so that some of them get bigger and bigger. And So what beach did his friend find the oyster on? <laughs> he wanted to keep it a secret of where he gets his oysters, but I said, ah. You know, if anything comes of it, we'll split the money, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Gordy at Max Oysters says they're probably not worth very much. All right, stay with us. We're going to have the latest on what's making headlines around the country, including the violence at a kids' hockey game in Alberta involving parents and a referee. That's coming up in just a sec. A kids hockey tournament in Lethbridge, Alberta descended into chaos yesterday after two people from the stands attacked a referee on the ice. Now one man has been charged and police are searching for another. Aaron Collins has more on what unfolded on the ice. This arena in Lethbridge is quiet today, but that wasn't the case less than 24 hours ago. That's when a privately run three-on-three -three hockey tournament for kids ended with a referee being beaten by relatives of one of the 10-year-old children playing in the tournament. In a video that surfaced on Twitter, two men can be seen pursuing the referee on the ice before tackling him and punching him repeatedly. I'm told by staff at the arena who witnessed the aftermath of the dust-up that it started after the game was finished. One of the young players apparently had words with the referee. The referee then instructed the child to leave the ice. 
At that point, the 10-year-old apparently swung his stick repeatedly at the referee, who then pushed the player to the ice. Now that's when two men can be seen rushing across the ice, knocking down a coach and tackling and then repeatedly punching a 55-year-old referee. The Lethbridge police say they've charged 55-year-old Robert Farrell Creighton with assault and say that charges are pending against a second 36-year-old. Both men are believed to be related to the 10-year-old who initially swung his stick at the referee. Now, the 10-year-old boy was not injured and the referee is not being investigated by police. The tournament was organized by High Performance Hockey. The company put out a statement on social media condemning the attack but have not returned calls for comment. Aaron Collins, CBC News. Lethbridge. In Quebec, back to school means dealing with the consequences of Bill 21. This week, a newly hired teacher at a Montreal school was told to remove her hijab. The issue is a contentious one in the province, but as Salima Shivji reports, it's not one federal leaders want to deal with in an election. Farin Ahmed is one of the lucky ones. Years at this school mean her right to teach while wearing her hijab is protected. Even so, she and other teachers feel targeted. Like, people are looking at them differently, even though they are grandfathered in. Um, you know, there were a group of parents who wrote a letter saying that they want the right to pull their kids out of their classes. That can't make anybody feel good. <laughs> There have been loud protests. There's a new anti-Bill 21 campaign complete with merchandise. There's also a legal challenge. But from the federal political parties on the eve of an election, there's been precious little. As a minority, we already have enough working against us, uh, but our government is supposed to be there to stand up for us, and that's not happening. The problem, the law is popular, and Quebec is once again a battleground. All of the federal leaders say they don't agree with the law, but quietly. That's on purpose. Mon identité, c'est ma fierté. Even the NDP's Jagmeet Singh hints at it, but doesn't mention the law specifically in his new ad to woo Quebecers. It's politically dangerous, especially for the ruling Liberals. They need to win seats in the rural regions of the province of Quebec. This is prime territory for Bill 21 support, which is basically just all the white, all francophone voters. It also highlights a shift for Justin Trudeau after four years in power. Back in 2015, he was forceful. In Canada, we protect minority rights. Mr. Harper, yes, see we'll we'll Canada. That. But defending the niqab sunk the NDP's Tom Mulcair. And so there's more caution for the now incumbent prime minister fighting to be re-elected. He says Canadians know where he stands. We do not feel that it is a government's uh, responsibility or in a government's interest to legislate on what people should be wearing. He just doesn't want to remind Quebecers of that too much. Salima Shipji, CBC News, Ottawa. Dorian blasts through Canada's east coast. We'll take you there as residents take stock of the damage. Stay with us.
And here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. When you hear um, that your children may have been in contact uh, with an adult in a situation like this, it's, it's very scary and concerning. A former youth hockey coach at the Burnaby Winter Club has been charged with multiple counts of possessing child pornography. Now, admittedly, this matter is and has been an absolute nightmare uh, for myself, my partner, and my family. Fort Moody's mayor is returning to office. Rob Vagramoff has been on leave since March following a sexual assault charge. NBC Ferries says its beer and wine sales pilot project, which had previously been promised by June, will now launch by late October. Beer and wine will be added to the Pacific Buffet menu on some southern routes. People in Atlantic Canada are cleaning up after Dorian ripped through the region over the weekend. The storm made landfall near Halifax as a post-tropical storm with hurricane-strength winds. As Elizabeth McMillan reports, the biggest concern today is widespread power outages. Waves and high winds churned coastal docks into debris, and the storm mangled buildings across Nova Scotia. Tammy Smith was giving her daughter a bath when she heard a bang. It was her apartment's roof coming off. As I looked out the window, I seen the roof and I heard everyone running and yelling. You're throwing your life in a bag for five, like in five minutes. It's like you don't even know what to even throw in. Your mind is in 10 different places. The storm hit Nova Scotia's Atlantic coast first, tracking all the way to Newfoundland. The strongest gusts reached about 140 kilometers an hour. The fierce winds toppled a crane at a construction site in downtown Halifax. But amazingly, no one in the region has been reported injured. First responders on Prince Edward Island did rush to rescue people in this campground when the storm surge flooded early Sunday morning. The costs of cleaning up are still unknown. Across Nova Scotia, schools were shut down today as crews assess the damage. Members of the military are assisting. Uprooted trees weighing down power lines still pose a safety risk. And by mid-afternoon, about 170,000 customers were still cut off. Cell phone service here also remains spotty, leaving people without the information they need. We had the roof cave in, so I was trying to find out, you know, what's going on, where, where are the shelters, and, you know, what do you do in this type of situation? And uh, even to find out, you know, when would the power come back on, I couldn't even Google anything. I, you know, it was just so frustrating. People have been seeking refuge at comfort centres, a place to shower, charge phones, or get a warm meal. Many are relying on generators and the generosity of friends and family. We've got our generator, plus we've got a smaller one that we just lent our neighbors so they can plug their freezer in and, and uh, their fridge so that they can, you know, so they don't lose their contents there. Some worry more planning is needed to ensure people in rural areas have somewhere to go. When there's no power in this community, a lot of us, uh, like myself, we're on well, so there's no power, there's no water, so... Uh, you know, people are tired, but they're, they're patient. Many residents will have to be patient for several more days. Nova Scotia Power says it could be up to a week before all of the utility's customers are reconnected. Elizabeth McMillan, CBC News, Halifax. Meanwhile, nine Burnaby firefighters have traveled to the Bahamas to help with rescue efforts there after Hurricane Dorian ravaged the island nation. The storm killed dozens of people and left thousands more homeless. The Burnaby firefighters are assisting with search and rescue operations, doing things like identifying and marking unsafe buildings and helping with body recovery. They're going to be there for a week. The team has been deployed to other disasters before. In 2005, they helped with rescue efforts after Hurricane Katrina and in 2015 traveled to Nepal to help out there after a deadly earthquake. Live look uh, from downtown Vancouver across the North Shore tonight at uh, not just coming up after 6.30. Quite the downpour, as you saw, in downtown Vancouver this afternoon. Some incredible video to show you. More of it coming up along with Brett's forecast next.
sitting there in the newsroom with my headset on, yeah. and I, I heard this this din of whatever, and I thought, was it a herd of wildebeests, or was it something else? See, and I equated it to being in a car wash, if you know the feeling of just sitting there, and you can hear the stuff pounding yeah. all on the roof of your car. Well, it was exactly like that, and uh, there will be more of that on the way this week, but if you wanted to see what it looked like, mm. Again, just to really kind of hit home the point, this is unusual. I mean, I know we say that Vancouver, we are on the wet coast here and everyone laughs, but to see f streets flooded like that, that only comes from quick and heavy downpours that are usually associated with thunderstorms. So we didn't get that satisfaction, I think, of seeing all of that lightning or hearing the thunder, but we got the rain instead. And I don't think we're gonna be seeing that at least for the next 24 to 48 hours, but we are gonna be dealing with another type of precipitation, and that's right, I I've changed my map now to say precipitation forecast instead of rainfall. And you know why? Because we're getting to that magical time of year where the Rockies are already going to be accumulating some snow. Now, it's really far away. We don't have to worry about that closer to the coast here, but it is something to be mentioning for the next couple of days. Lots of wet weather expected for the southern half of the province. We will be clearing up throughout Tuesday and into Wednesday, but I wanted to show you what I'm already looking at for late week. We are adjusting into a fall pattern here. We've been really spoiled with a lot of sunshine and warm temperatures over the last week but this is such a classic fall setup we're gonna see a wave of moisture come through on Thursday from the Pacific we're looking at quite a lot of rain at that point and then we're gonna see yet another one of those come across so this is all from the lows that we would associate over the Gulf of Alaska there and we may even actually see some snow accumulating in some of the coast mountains there so what is that gonna be doing for our temperatures well of course with all of that rain it's gonna be blocking out the Sun and that is gonna be keeping temperatures definitely on the cooler side back down to around 20 degrees or so for here on the coast and even into the interior likely not going to be getting up to anywhere higher than about 25 degrees for both tomorrow and for Wednesday but then when we look ahead into our five-day forecast there is some positive stuff here I do want to mention for Tuesday and Wednesday still a decent amount of sunshine in the forecast maybe a few clouds here and there but it is going to be that transition as we end off the week that's Thursday again where I've got pretty high confidence we're not going to be sitting this rain out everyone on the southern half the province is going to get into that and then really I think the heaviest strain is going to be coming as we love it just in time for the weekend <laughs> isn't it fun how that uh, works out you and your weekend I know wow. I just love ruining them yeah. for you know every, it's not ruining thanks it, so but, much. <laughs> yeah well I know with rain there are diehard people that love to mm -hmm. bike in it and I mean yes. kids as well they will actually bike over to school on a daily basis but at one school in particular here in Manitoba they changed it up they actually put a bike in the classroom. Yeah, as CBC's Laura Gawaki reports, the added exercise has been of an unexpected hit. In Mrs. Peter's grade four class, there's one seat all kids want. They can take all your energy out and when you feel sad or lonely, this can help you a lot. South Oaks Elementary School has nine stationary bikes like this. One is for adults and the rest are for kids. Classes in grades one through four can take a spin anytime. I've seen the bike, especially in winter, is so beneficial to just have us have a place to move around and get some of, some of our pent up energy out. <laughs> it's getting too easy. Longtime teacher Alvira Peters uses the bikes to help her eight and nine year olds pay attention. Whether they're down and need to be alert, or more commonly, when they're struggling to sit still. I just see them coming off of it, um, feeling refreshed and heading back to their jobs. Um, uh, at the end of the year, they'll just be working there. They'll be doing all their work on the bike. They'll be reading there. So I just feel like it's, it's a real holistic kind of approach. South Oaks principal Dale Martins pays for the bikes with a grant from the Hanover School Division. They cost about $700 each and are designed especially for classrooms. The bikes are virtually silent and small enough for a six-year-old. Martins wants to eventually have bikes in all his classrooms. It also really helps the teachers actually because I just had a grade one teacher who was here last year, had a bike, and this year we didn't have a bike for her. She's in a different room and she says to me, I'm, I miss that bike. Mrs. Peters' grade four students continue to ride. She hopes the bike encourages active habits early so kids work out all year long and beyond. Laura Glowacki, CBC News, Grunthal, Manitoba. A challenging rescue for certain missing sailors pulled from the belly of an overturned cargo ship. Now, rescuers managed to pull it off next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Mike Colleen at the Surrey Police Officer of the Year Awards. Get your tickets today and celebrate the hard work of our Surrey RCMP. And get your tickets and join Gloria Makarenko at Splash, Arts Umbrellas Art Auction and Gala. Experience the power of creativity and help support the arts. For more on these events, check us out, cbc.ca slash bc. A frightening experience for four crew members stuck in a capsized ship has ended safely. The South Korean crew members spent more than a day trapped inside the vessel. As Paul Hunter reports, the rescue operation wasn't an easy one. Woo! Yeah! Like a scene out of a 70s disaster movie, somehow they got him out. Safety tonight for the final trapped crew member, making it all four now rescued from within the belly of that giant flipped cargo ship, found and extracted just like they do in the movies. Uh, there was just a system of tapping where they would do three or four taps or more, and eventually uh, they got tap backs. After that, holes were drilled, contact was made, and the smile tells the rest. This man made his escape earlier. Uh, their condition is uh, is relatively good for having spent uh, you know close to 30, uh, 34 or 35 hours in the conditions they are in. Indeed, think about it. Trapped inside that, no food, no water, not knowing if they'd ever get out alive. And no one knows yet why any of this happened. On board some 4,000 cars in transit from Georgia to Baltimore. The ship off the coast of Georgia overnight Saturday with its crew of mostly South Koreans and Filipinos for some reason tilted and then capsized. 20 crew members were quickly airlifted up and out, but fire prevented rescuers from getting to the final four on board, leading to the drama that played out today. And with all those aboard now rescued, investigators can step up their work figuring out what caused this. And that other task can now begin, how to get the ship upright and towed to shore. Meanwhile, for the U.S. Coast Guard and for that final crew member brought to safety tonight, a round of applause for a job well done. The last to be rescued was described as being super happy. All things considered, who wouldn't be? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's attempt to trigger a snap election suffered another devastating setback today. He failed to secure the number of votes needed, but he has suspended Parliament. CBC's Cameron McIntosh reports on today's dramatic day. Good morning, everybody. Signing the Irish Prime Minister's guest book, it turns out on the page next to a friend. Donald Trump. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson in Dublin, looking for a better week than last. I want to find a deal. I want to get a deal. With a clear change in tone. No, not backing away from a no-deal Brexit, but urging negotiations to avoid it. The UK could certainly get through it, but be in no doubt that outcome would be a failure of statecraft for which we would all be responsible. Ireland's border is the issue. Johnson wants to renegotiate an agreement to keep it barrier free by keeping Northern Ireland tied to the EU. It's a hard no from the Irish Prime Minister. Uh, no backstop is no deal uh, for us. There's the impasse. Today, Parliament put Johnson in a corner with a law requiring him to ask for a Brexit extension. Johnson is refusing, as 10 Downing is said to be looking for ways around it, including asking the EU to just ignore the request. And now, with 52 days until Brexit, Parliament is suspended. Johnson is proroguing it for five weeks. I think it's disgraceful. Parliament should be sitting and Parliament should be holding the government to account. And the Prime Minister appears to be wanting to run away. In Parliament's closing hours, another headache for Johnson. The nose to the left, 302. Oh. The opposition won the public release of internal no-deal Brexit documents. While Johnson's attempt to circumvent all of this by again trying to call a snap election failed. The majority does not satisfy the requirements of the fixed-term 
Parliament's act. As Brexit now hinges on Johnson either getting a deal or getting around the law. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, London. Well, here in Vancouver, we are certainly used to sky-high real estate prices. And on the other side of the country, residents of Toronto can certainly relate. But even in that hot real estate market, a new listing is raising some eyebrows. Listed for a cool $600,000, it's described as a rare opportunity in a desirable neighborhood. But as Hoya Fidel reports, there's a catch. You're about 10 minutes walking distance uh, to the subway station on Danforth. Nima Kadem works for the brokerage selling this property. He says a piece of land like this is in high demand in Toronto. So this is the property. It's a one-car garage and it's going for $599,000. Now just to give you an idea of the size, I brought my measuring tape. It's 100 feet long and 20 feet wide. Now this price might sound outrageous, but realtors in Toronto say given the potential of the property, that price is actually a steal. This is ideal to put up a two-story house for the finished basement, and you could look at anywhere from 1,500 to over 2,000 square feet of living space. A few doors down in the same neighborhood is another same-sized property. What has your experience been like so far? There's actually uh, two adults and two young kids under the age of five, and uh, for us, there's plenty of space, right? We're looking at 2,100 square feet. The home was a bungalow, but was recently renovated to include a second story. He says now his home is actually one of the bigger ones in the neighborhood. So as far as size, uh, it's more than enough, I think. Especially in this area, most houses aren't much larger than about 700 square feet in terms of footprint. This home is also sitting on the same size of property as the garage. It was sold for $2.1 million last summer. But is the potential of the property really worth almost $600,000? Most people I spoke to said no. No, I'm not surprised. I'm sad because it shouldn't be like that. It makes it inaccessible for a lot of young people. Can't get into this. This used to be a neighborhood where first time home buyers could buy in, and it's not that anymore. According to the Toronto Real Estate Board, the supply is not meeting the demand for housing in the GTA, and the price gap between condos and detached or semi-detached homes is shrinking. This is why Kadem says buyers are looking for alternatives. They're opting for a detached home on a smaller lot because they can raise a family, they have a backyard, they have a garage, and it's close by all the amenities you need. But even so, not everybody is sold on this idea. If I had $600,000 lying around, no, I wouldn't buy it. The thing that shocks me the most about it is just how normal that seems to me now. I'm like, oh, that doesn't surprise me at all. But if I think about it a little more, I'm like, people from most other cities, definitely at least in Canada, would be super shocked by that. So far, there are no offers on the garage. Hawaii Fidel, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the cannabis industry is claiming a business opportunity is going up in smoke. Some retailers believe there's big money to be made in pot tourism if there was just more done to promote it. More from the CBC's Jason Vio in Windsor. Tourism offices aren't planning ahead when it comes to cannabis tourism. That's because Health Canada's rules don't allow marijuana to be marketed to the masses. But some people are taking cannabis tourism into their own hands, like this ship here, which is set to be the first cannabis cruise to set sail along the Detroit River. That's between Windsor and Michigan, a state that just legalized marijuana late last year. Officially, though, tourism bureaus say marketing cannabis can be tricky especially when you're reaching out to other jurisdictions where um, it's not legal. So uh, we're still working our way through those kinds of sensitivities. Um, and of course, we're also making sure that we respect uh, the visitors that are coming in and making sure that we continue to honour um, uh, their culture and their uh, the rules in which they live by. Right now, cannabis marketing is similar to tobacco, very restrictive with the goal of keeping it out of the hands of young people. But some feel it should be more like alcohol when it comes to advertising. The wine connoisseur in some ways is not different than the cannabis connoisseur. People do come to Ontario for to check out wine country, etc. And I, 
you know, one would hope that over time, maybe we could develop the same reputation when it comes to cannabis. Health Canada says cannabis can only be promoted in ways where people under the age of 18 won't be able to see it. Direct email, for example. It also can't be broadcast or aired anywhere outside of Canada, even in jurisdictions where it might be legal, and it can't be associated with a particular way of life, such as recreation or glamour. Now, the Cannabis Act will be reviewed in 2021, three years after that legislation rolled out. Jason Vio, CBC News, Windsor. Well, Bianca and Rescue is certainly getting the star treatment south of the border after winning the U.S. Open Tennis Championship on the weekend. And that's just the beginning. The 19-year-old will also get a hero's welcome when she returns home to Toronto. As CBC's Greg Ross explains, the attention could turn into big bucks from endorsements for the young tennis star. Our next guest. The championship the tour continued for Bianca Andrescu Monday in New York. Canada. Bianca, good morning. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. Bianca. Congrats. Hitting the U.S. talk show this circuit this morning, baby. appearing here on so NBC's crazy. The Today Last Show, but sticking to her Canadian roots. Bianca, you almost, it seemed as if you were almost apologizing after the win. <laughs> Why? That's such a Canadian thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> How does that trophy feel in your hand? Oh, I'm never going to get tired of holding this thing. <laughs> Back home, plans are already in the works for a oh, hero's welcome. I've already promised to give her the keys to the city. This the mayor of her hometown of Mississauga rare. also expecting tens of thousands for a rally when she returns, similar to the crowds they had during the Raptors playoff run. I think the right thing to do is to hold it in our celebration square. But the win translates into much more than just accolades. When you win a championship like this, brands come calling from... York University States. sports marketing instructor VJ Settler says the win could mean millions of dollars in endorsements for Andrescu. And he says she has a marketable personality. She exhibits all of the, the characteristics and qualities that a lot of brands are interested in, in associating with. When you look at how she's conducted herself, whether it be uh, in training, whether it be uh, before the big match, after uh, the match, after having won the U.S. Open in the news conferences, she's shown a lot of humility. She, she's shown a lot of determination, a lot of perseverance. All of this is a lot for a 19-year-old to take in. But her coach, Sylvain Bruno, says she has a good team around her. I think we have a good connection, so we'll as a lot of other things we'll discuss, and I think her parents are super good too, and the rest of the team as well. So I think she's gonna have a good buffer and people who are gonna keep her grounded. The Bianca excitement will likely only ramp up in the coming days, as she's expected to return home to Canada later this week. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the man who was the voice behind Jerome the Giraffe on the long-running CBC Children's program, The Friendly Giant, has died. Rod Conybear died last Thursday in Lindsay, Ontario. Hello, Rusty. Hello, Jerome. Well, it certainly has been a nice rainy day. I like rain, and I thought I'd just go out for a walk in the rain. The writer, performer, and broadcaster was also the voice of Rusty the Rooster on the popular program. Conybear began his career in radio, where he received numerous awards for his work. CBC radio fans will remember him as Rod in The Rod and Charles Show. Rod Conybear was 89 years old. Well, the Vancouver Aquarium hopes you'll give its newest guest a warm welcome. We'll introduce you to Taslina next.
Okay, there's a new resident at the Vancouver Aquarium for you to say hello to. <laughs> Teslina, the new baby sea otter, was flown in from Alaska over the weekend. Fisherman found her earlier this year without any family around and her umbilical cord still attached. Yeah, now Teslina won't be released into the wild anytime soon. Seal otter pups are very dependent on their mothers. And with none around, staff need to take care of her for 24 hours a day. Now, bottle feeding and teaching her how to groom her fur is all on the agenda for the next little she while. She was around people from such a young age. And she also, we, as much as we try to teach her those sea otter life skills, at the end of the day, we're not sea otters. Um, so if she was to be released out, of the, out into the ocean, um, she wouldn't have that fear of people. And she also might not know things that sea otters are supposed to know. And Teslina is going to have the next few days to get comfortable with her new surroundings after the trainers will start introducing her to the other otters. I mean, that's pretty adorable. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, fair enough. And uh, thousands of pollinators are at risk of extinction. Now some cities are actually modifying bylaws to try to encourage residents to take up backyard beekeeping, and it's working. Yeah, in Greater Vancouver, beekeeping schools are reporting increases of 50% or more in beginner enrollment at, over the last 10 years. And you know what? Master beekeepers say that a growing number of these novice beekeepers are millennials. My name is Kelly Davies, and I'm an urban beekeeper here in Vancouver. Um, it's a hobby, but it's, it's, it's turning into more than a hobby. I've been a beekeeper for four years now. I think it just in, in general, it's, it's good to care about pollinators and have more pollinators in the neighborhood to increase the biodiversity in the neighborhood. Um, they're like a really important ecosystem um, service. Yeah, I like to um, bring the awareness of what's going on um, with bees. Um, I think urban bees are actually probably one of the happiest and healthiest bees. I think people are just becoming more environmentally conscious and they're realizing how important bees are. Um, and also it's just a really fun thing to do. <laughs> I fell in love as soon as I started doing it. So I, I understand why people are, are, are starting. It's a trend now. and people are starting to fall in love. I'm hoping to bring more bees to schools. The Hive is such a unique and powerful educational tool. You can really apply it to almost any subject. There's a few schools that in like Metro Van that do have bees, um, but I'd like to see more and more. So this year I'm, I'm working with an elementary school in Burnaby to bring them their first honeybees. And I hope to just continue doing that. Yeah, it's a pretty cool story, and now I'm so enthusiastic about that. An uncle in my family is actually an urban beekeeper, and he introduced me to the whole process. But even cool, I think, CBC, on the roof of this building here, we have our bees up there. It's important work. It is. Yes, it's it very is. important. Keep them going. <laughs> Definitely. That's it for us tonight. Thanks for watching. Dan is here at 11 after the National. Good night.